Peaceful anti-war protesters on college campuses across the country are being brutalized by cops. They're being tear gassed and assaulted and police aren't letting medics tend to their wounds in some instances. And this all comes after pundits and politicians incited this violence against these anti-war protesters. But I guess their thirst for violence against these protesters hasn't quite been satiated yet because after comparing these protesters to uh, neo-Nazis who marched in Charlottesville in 2017, uh, they're rolling out even more spears against them to incite more violence against them. Case in point. What the hell is going on? What are these universities doing? Why aren't they doing something? And I'll echo the horror um, uh, that this does look like January 6th. What a terrible example for our students. Um, at the same time, these are young adults. And the question is, why do you choose to learn about the complexities of other situations around the world? But this one, you want to set up an encampment. This one, you want to scare people. This one, you want to come to the edge of violence or even go to violence. Not, not the this edge. one, They're you risk your future and your education for. Hey, Mika, if this looks like January 6th to you, you are a stupid person or a hack or both. The violence that we're seeing is mostly instigated by police. But since the protesters haven't stopped, you want more cops to come in and brutalize them further. You're the one who wants violence, Mika. You're the one who needs to educate yourself. You're the one being hateful because you clearly don't view Gazans as human beings. But Mika is just a microcosm of a bigger issue in this country right now, where our entire ruling class has chosen to hyper-focus on these protesters in order to ignore the genocide taking place that's being supported by our government. But let me show you how desperate they've gotten in their attempt to demonize these protesters. Lauren Elke Schramm of the New York Post writes, Long withheld rage from COVID shutdowns to blame for pro-Palestine protests, according to experts. Oh, this is what the experts are saying, apparently. But it gets better. Josh Levine of the New York Post writes, college students aren't having enough sex, so they're turning to anti-Israel protests, according to an NYU professor. Or, and this is just a theory, maybe they're against their university's affiliation with businesses that are complicit with Israel's genocide. Call me crazy, I know, but perhaps they're protesting the thing that they're saying they're protesting. But I mean, cops were sent in as demanded the protesters have been thoroughly demonized by all of media and our political class and yet the students are still going in fact the protesters at columbia took over an entire building and i say good for them but you see their defiance is really what's getting under the skin of people in our ruling class because when they say you're supposed to do something you not listening is unacceptable because they're the ones with the power so how dare you not listen to the powerful and it's pissing them off. And as a result, they're concocting new ways to try to rein in these protesters who are just trying to say, hey, we don't want our tuition dollars funding a genocide. For example, Democrat Richie Torres, who took more than $1.2 million from the Israel lobby, teamed up with Republican Mike Lawler, who took $116,000 from the Israel lobby to propose the Columbia Act, which stands for College Oversight and Legal Updates Mandating Bias Investigations and Accountability Acts. And this is going to give the Department of Education the authority to impose a third-party anti-Semitism monitor in universities that take federal money. And to be clear, what this legislation means by anti anti-Semitism monitor is anti-Israel monitor. That's what this is about. This is the college equivalent of BDS, which is a thing in 38 states, by the way. But I mean, if that wasn't enough, Democrats like Josh Gothheimer and Dan Goldman, who took $200,000 and $193,000 in bribes from the pro-Israel industry, respectively, co-wrote a letter to Columbia's board of trustees criticizing them for not disbanding what they called anti-Israel and anti-Jewish protests, which is a load of horseshit. And the letter was co-signed by 21 other APAC-funded Democrats. Democrats, including Jared Moskowitz, who took $138,000 from the Israel lobby, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who took $855,000 from the Israel lobby, and of course, Reggie Torres, but also Adam Schiff, who took nearly a million dollars from the Israel lobby, just to name a few. Now, the reason why I'm telling you the amount of money that these politicians took from the Israel lobby is because it's important that you know that they're all compromised. They are trying to crack down on American citizens' freedom to criticize a foreign government 
at the behest of that foreign government who's funding them. And by their own standards, this kind of foreign influence is unacceptable. In fact, Jared Moskowitz showed up to a House Oversight Committee hearing wearing a Putin mask in order to shame Republicans spreading disinformation at the behest of the Russian government. But I mean, if it's bad when Russia or China does it, is it not equally bad when Israel does it? I guess not. I guess that some Democrats are willing to make exceptions for foreign governments, specifically the ones that are funding them. But that's not necessarily surprising since our government is already making exceptions for our allies, especially Israel when it comes to human rights and international law. So, I mean, of course, Democrats are suddenly OK with foreign meddling if it's one of our allies, again, who happen to be bankrolling their campaigns. The hypocrisy on full display is overwhelming but they don't even give a shit at this point like the ends justify the means but this isn't unique to israel to be clear or unique to democrats trump vetoed legislation ending u.s complicity with saudi arabia's genocide in yemen after they buttered him up right in a number of ways not just campaign contributions but staying in his hotels when he was president so foreign influence is very much a problem in american politics but we should be consistent and condemn all of it and not just the country's influencing American politics that we don't like. But if these Democrats demanding a crackdown on peaceful protests feels a little bit authoritarian or even fascist to you, well, you're not wrong. And I'm sure you'll be unsurprised to know that fascists actually agree with these Democrats like Richie Torres and Jared Moskowitz. In fact, Trump tweeted, stop the protests now, because like other politicians, he's also against Americans exercising their First Amendment rights if it's speech that he disagrees with. Remember, this is the same guy who tweeted out, when the looting starts, the shooting starts about Black Lives matter protesters and now democrats are teaming up with the same fascists that they were criticizing four years ago to shut down speech that they don't like speech from individuals who are their constituents to be clear which is real smart democrats in an election year that is uh what i call true bipartisanship in action right as alejandra caraballo put it when she was on the leftist mafia liberals are basically one moral panic away from becoming full-blown fascists and we're kind of seeing that right now with a lot of democrats and by the way, we're not done talking about things that members of Congress are doing to crack down on free speech. This is not going to be an exhaustive list. There are Republicans going on Fox News saying that they shouldn't get federal dollars if they don't break up the protests. But what I want to talk about here are the Democrats who, in theory, should be better because they're the ones who purport to be the defenders of democracy. But yet they're teaming up with fascists to attack our freedom of speech. For example, Jared Moskowitz teamed up with a Republican to find a new way to crack down on free speech. I'll let him explain what he wants to do. Well, the House Rules Committee voted yesterday to advance a bipartisan bill that would codify the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism into Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The legislation is being led by Republican Congressman Mike Lawler of New York, who joins us now, along with Democratic Congressman Jared Moskowitz of Florida. He is co-sponsor of the bill. Gentlemen, thank you for being on this morning. Congressman Lawyer, I'd li Lawler, I'd like to start with you um, to tell us more about the bill and what you hope to accomplish with this in a bipartisan effort. Well, I think, Mika, what we're seeing on college campuses right now is a failure to act and a failure to lead. And part of the problem is uh, the lack of a very clear definition of anti-Semitism. And so what this bill would do is force the Department mm -hmm. of Education to adopt the IRA working definition and its contemporary examples for all of its Title VI uh, discrimination enforcement cases. And I think defining it very clearly and forcing these uh, schools to act uh, is critically important in this moment. And so, Congressman Moskowitz, explain how it would define it and how it could change the game as to what's happening on college campuses. Where's the ambiguity here? Because a lot of us don't see any ambiguity on hatred. No, thanks, Mika uh, and Joe, and morning, Joe, and thank you for, for having us and talking about this issue. No, listen, it's going to give, obviously, more teeth uh, to the federal government uh, to enforce their rules and regulations. It's going to give more teeth to uh, universities and colleges across the country. I mean, this mm -hmm. is, as, as the president of U.S. said in the beginning of that statement, this is not complicated, right? What no. we're seeing is we're seeing universities complicated by failing to lead and protect their students, failing to enforce their code of conduct mm -hmm. book. 
taking options off the table, giving all the power to the protesters. Listen, I have been to Colombia. I have talked to Jewish students. I have talked to the parents. And, and while there are peaceful protesters, while we do not want to lose sight, obviously, of the plight of the people in Gaza, it's a real war, and it's terrible what's happening to the people in Gaza. Make no mistake about it, there is a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism on what's going on on these college campuses. We have members in this body pouring gasoline on that by saying Jews fall into two buckets, pro-genocide and anti-genocide. I mean, I got... I got a 10-year-old and 7-year-old oh. Jewish children. I don't know if they're pro-genocide or anti-genocide. I, I guess I'll talk to them about that. Uh, and so this is what's going on. I, I, remember, I remember when Charlottesville happened. It was universal condemnation. Mm. And, the people, and the people who tried to ignore that or explain it away or say it's not everybody, we condemn those people. But here, for some right. reason, when it's Jews go back to Poland, bomb Tel Aviv, all of a sudden it's peaceful. Lots to unpack there, but notice that he didn't actually provide a definition of anti-Semitism. And there's good reason for that. It's because what he's really trying to do is stifle criticism of Israel, but that's definitionally not anti-Semitism. So what he's trying to do is muddy the waters by highlighting just a few anecdotes of things that he's heard in order to paint all protesters with a really broad brush. But the problem is there's always going to be bad apples in mass movements. And more importantly, there's always going to be outside agitators that try to provoke a violent response or instigate violence against the protesters. And we've been seeing that at these protests. For example, as the Daily Beast reports, a pro-Israel agitator at Northeastern University shouted, kill the Jews, and everyone else was arrested for it. And if you watch the video, the people booed that person, yet they were still penalized for the violent rhetoric that they didn't say and condemned. And part of the problem with this narrative that all of these students are violent anti-Semites is that Jewish students are overrepresented at these protests. So is it not absurd to say that these Jewish students are all anti-Semites for protesting what a foreign government does? Of course it's absurd. But in response to that inconvenient fact, the media is doubling down on the smearing. And CNN's Abby Phillips brought on a Jewish student from Colombia that compared the Jewish protesters that we're seeing on college campuses across the country to blacks for Trump or gays for Trump. Because if you're against your university's association with a genocidal foreign government, you're apparently against your own self-interest for some reason. How does it benefit these students to support the actions of a foreign government? How does it benefit them to have their tuition dollars support this in an indirect and direct way? That doesn't make any sense. It's nonsensical, but the media will say and do anything to demonize these protesters and push a certain narrative. Furthermore, why wouldn't CNN bring on Jewish students who are part of the protests if they care about what Jewish students have to say? Why only platform the people who are against the protests? Well, it's because that wouldn't fit the narrative, right? But speaking of the narrative, some politicians are thankfully pushing back against this idea that all of these protesters are anti-Semitic. And that's what Jared Moskowitz was responding to when he referenced whether or not his seven and eight year old children were pro-genocide or not. He was directly responding to comments that Ilhan Omar made that the media has been also obsessing about because shocker. Now, keep in mind, his issue with Ilhan Omar's comments is that she's supposedly smearing Jewish people as pro-genocide while he literally smears the protesters by comparing them to neo-nazis who marched in charlottesville in 2017 again so hypocritical so i mean if anyone's a smear merchant it's him but i don't think that this cry bully actually believes the bullshit that he's spewing and i think you'll agree with me once we see what ilhan said so let's take a look at her comments specifically within the context of another cnn host dana bash trying to get bernie sanders to condemn them because of course, that's what the fuck they would do. Why wouldn't they? Senator, I, I do want to ask you about something that your friend and colleague, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, uh, said when she visited Colombia this week and she supported the protests. I think it is really unfortunate that people don't care about the, the fact that all Jewish kids should be kept safe and that we should not have to tolerate anti-Semitism um, or bigotry for all Jewish students, whether they are pro-genocide or anti-genocide. Some Jewish students are pro-genocide. Are you comfortable with that? So, I'm sorry, someone? She said some Jewish students are pro-genocide. Is that something that you're comfortable with that? Well, I don't know exactly. Look, what I think the essential point that Ilhan made 
is that we do not want to see uh, anti-Semitism in this country. And I think the word genocide is something that is being determined by the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. But this is what I will say. I don't think there's any doubt that what Netanyahu is doing now, displacing 80% of the population uh, in Gaza is ethnic cleansing. That's what it is. Pushing out huge numbers of people. And now we're looking at the possibility of an attack on Rafa, where people have gone for so-called uh, as a safety zone. So what's going on there, again, to my mind, is outrageous. And as you've indicated, I strongly oppose U.S. Uh, funding for Netanyahu's war machine. I think that was a really good response from Bernie Sanders. I'm glad that he didn't take the bait and he tried to recenter the conversation to what really matters, the actions of the Israeli government, because I think that the media's point in hyper-focusing on these college campuses and their protests is to distract you from what they don't want to talk about, which is the war crimes that Israel is committing in Gaza. But notice how in the clip where they say Ilhan Omar is being anti-Semitic, she literally explicitly condemned anti-Semitism and not only that, she defended the free speech rights of all students, regardless of where they happen to fall on this particular issue. In other words, she's the one who's against the violence. She's the one who's against cops coming in and cracking anyone's skulls, unlike the people condemning these protesters and begging for cops to come in and violently shut down these protests. But because she dared to acknowledge that some students, including Jewish students, are effectively pro-genocide since they support the actions of the Israeli government, well, they disregard everything else she said and call her an anti-Semite. I mean, that doesn't mean that it's just Jewish students who are pro-genocide. There are non-Jewish students who are pro-Zionist who support the actions and defend the actions of the Israeli government. You're trying to purposefully twist what she's saying to fit your narrative. But I mean, she's not the one painting with a broad brush. They are. But Jared Moskowitz, he took what she said and he suggested that she is implying that all Jewish people are pro-genocide, including his children. But that's not what she said. And he unnecessarily tried to make it seem as if she was demonizing his children and tried to portray them as the victims when her daughter is literally suspended for protesting at Columbia University. But I mean, the subtext here is that anyone who accuses someone of supporting genocide because they defend the actions of the Israeli government, they're using an anti-Semitic dog whistle. That's the subtext here, especially if they're Jewish. But that's bullshit. You can criticize the Israeli government and disagree and criticize somebody who defends the Israeli government. And what Jared Moskowitz is doing here is dangerous because anti-Semitism is real. And cynical accusations of anti-Semitism against people like Ilhan Omar emboldens actual anti-Semites. Downplaying Charlottesville and saying that these protesters are like the neo-Nazis that marched in Charlottesville, that downplays the significance of actual anti-Semitism. But I mean, foreign-funded liars like Jared Moskowitz don't actually care because he's choosing to undermine actual anti-Semitism by comparing anti-war protesters to fucking Charlottesville, all to behoove his donor. And it's just incredibly bad faith and gross. But I mean, that's what Jared Moskowitz does. He also recently implied that Bernie Sanders doesn't care about anti-Semitism because Bernie Sanders dared to condemn U.S. taxpayer money going to Netanyahu. And in response, Moskowitz said, Bernie, now do anti-Semitism. Why so quiet? So he's implying that Bernie Sanders doesn't care about anti-Semitism, which is fucking insane. And AOC actually chimed in to defend Bernie, saying, Senator Sanders' family was killed in the Holocaust. He dedicates his every moment to realizing tikkun olam, his commitment to protecting innocent since in Gaza stems from his Jewish values. He and many other Jewish leaders deserve better than to be treated this way. This is shameful. Now, in response, he chose to play the respectability card, saying, my family was also killed in the Holocaust in Germany and in Poland. My grandmother was in the kinder transport. They also instilled values in me. It's why I voted for aid to Israel and for aid to Gaza. That doesn't make any sense because you're voting to give the same people that were bombing food to. Maybe just stop the fucking bombs. But he adds, we see each other at work. We are both better than doing this here. Now in response, she asked, is that what this is? And she includes a screenshot of a tweet that he liked from Michael Rappaport, who is a psychopath, telling her to fuck off. He is incapable of being honest. It's almost Trumpian which kind of makes sense since Moskowitz is in lockstep with Trump on this very issue. But the common theme is that none of the opponents to these student protesters, whether it's politicians or pundits, are willing to actually engage with the arguments that the students are making in good faith. And that's not necessarily surprising for the fact that they also refuse to engage with our opposition to genocide in good faith and just choose to smear us as anti-Semites. It's our right 
as American citizens to critique the actions of a foreign government, especially if we are paying for that violence. So I don't think you're ever going to get people to stop criticizing Israel by cynically saying that they're being anti-Semitic for criticizing a foreign government. It's not Islamophobic to criticize Saudi Arabia. It's not racist to criticize an African government's actions. And it's certainly not anti-Semitic to criticize the government of Israel. He knows this, but he's lying on purpose. But what Israel is doing is indefensible, which is why they can't defend it. And since it can't be defended, they lie and they obfuscate and they cry anti-Semitism and cry you support Hamas. And that dishonesty right there specifically is why they're losing people, right? And on that note, to demonstrate this, a pro-Israel Karen who called the cops on college students for not letting her leave is, I think, the perfect illustration of the dishonesty that we're seeing from opponents to these students. Nobody is going to hurt them. Nobody is going to attack them. This person is not in harm's way. They are free to leave. Nobody is going to hurt them. Nobody is going to attack them. This person is not in harm's way. Yes, they're right in front of me right now. They're really fine. This person is not in harm's way. I need funds, genocide. I need help. I know that, but they're all they're surrounding me. They won't let me move. No, no, you are free to move. You are free to move. She is free to move. You are free to move. You are free to move. She's free to move. She's free to leave. She is free to leave. No one is surrounding her. Nobody is surrounding you. She is free to leave. You are free to leave. Please help. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's Western University. These are students. They're, they're, no, they're surrounding me. I can take a picture. She's free to leave. No one is surrounding her. No one is surrounding her. No one is surrounding her. I'm just walking my dog. I need help. She's free to leave. I'm a Jewish American. I need help. Please come and help me. I love how as that cry bully was claiming she was being targeted specifically because she was Jewish, which is not true, obviously, as you saw, there was a Jewish student right there with a sign that said Jews for divestment. Why won't the media and politicians mention that? Why won't they condemn people like that woman? I mean, doesn't she make their anti-Semitism argument look hollow? I mean, it's one person, but they're the ones using anecdotes to generalize an entire movement, so why not condemn her? And on the subject of a condemning speech, I haven't heard the media or really any politician condemn this. <laughs> So in case you can't hear what she was saying, she was telling student protesters that she hopes, I'm assuming Hamas, rapes them. Yeah. It's not the first time that a supporter of Israel has called for sexual violence against peaceful anti-genocide protesters, and I'm sure that it won't be the last. But I love how there's these two conflicting narratives about these students. On one hand, they're called dangerous hate mobs, yet that woman was bold enough to wish rape on them. I mean, I don't think that she would be courageous enough to wish rape on them if they were an actual pitchfork fucking mob but i mean the video is already long enough and my uh my brain is rotted enough so i'm just going to end by saying that all of these students are amazing they are on the right side of history and i commend each and every one of them for the courage that it takes to stand up and speak truth to power and what they're doing matters hence why all of media and our political elites are trying to shut them down they're very clearly hitting a nerve and what they're doing is working. So keep it up. We stand with you. And listen, to the people who don't agree with them, you can disagree with them. It's a free country. But try to do that without smearing them or calling for violence against them by either begging the cops to come in and crack some skulls or wishing rape on them. Can you just like say, hey, I disagree with what they're doing? They can't because they can't help themselves. Because unlike these students, the politicians and pundits demonizing these students are actually the ones supporting violence, both against them and the people in Gaza.